The following audio has been brought to you by Word of Grace Community Church. For more information about Word of Grace, visit WOGCC.com. What are the four things that we've learned over the past few weeks? Let's say them together. You can cheat on the screen, but you shouldn't have to. Are you ready? Here we go. Less is more. Stress is bad. Giving is good. And tomorrow matters. Aren't you glad? This is the last time I'm going to ask you to do this. Are you ready? Let's get this inside of us. Less is more. Stress is bad. Giving is good, and tomorrow matters. These are the four keys that we've been talking about over the past few weeks as we're looking at making change in the way that we handle our finances, how we honor God by the managing and stewarding of the finances that God has blessed us with. We've learned that less is more, that better is one handful with tranquility, with peace, than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. We've learned that stress is bad, that financial stress is bad. You don't really have to preach a sermon about that for us to know that. But at the same time, we did learn how we can delight ourselves in the Lord and that he will give us the desires of our heart. But first, we must delight in him so he can temper the desires of our heart so that we begin to want what God wants for the same reason God wants it. And then last week, we talked about giving is good, that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. We talked about how receiving is fun, and there's nothing wrong with receiving. But as much fun as receiving is, Jesus said that giving is better. There is a joy attached to to generosity. And there's a freedom attached to generosity. And we want to intentionally prioritize generosity in a way to where we're living below our means so we can have margin to be able to bless other people. And we're not controlled by stuff and finances, but yet we're living as kingdom examples, as lights in a dark world so that we can truly make change in our lives. And today we're going to talk about tomorrow matters. I believe that the biggest challenge that our world faces right now and our generation faces is truly this addiction that we have and this conditioning that we have to this instant gratification. We're spoiled to instant gratification. And we know this is true because we want everything yesterday. We think that it should already be there and we're entitled to having it right now. Matter of fact, we miss the subtle awesomeness of simple things that we take for granted because we've become so conditioned to have everything our way right away. I heard a comedian on a late night talk show share this. He said, I can't believe this young spoiled generation. There was a guy sitting next to me on an airplane and he was complaining while we were flying through the air that his Wi-Fi was slow. He said, let's think about this for a second. Have you not marveled at the fact that you're sitting in a comfortable chair and you're reclined back in a temperature-controlled, climate-controlled environment flying through the sky? He said, have you stopped to think about that for a minute? And have you also stopped to think for a second that you're also on a device that is communicating with outer space that is smaller than a book? He said, wow, simultaneously flying through the sky. It's amazing if you stop and think about it, but we don't think it's amazing. We get frustrated when we don't get what we want right away. We get frustrated with Amazon, two-day shipping. Are you kidding me? Two days? I want it yesterday. Why can't it be here in the next five minutes? Two-day shipping? Are you kidding me? Who came up with this idea? I have to wait a whole two days. We don't want to wait until the next week of our favorite show comes out. No, we want to take an entire weekend and binge watch Netflix with someone, and we just sit there and just go through show after show. Oh, I wonder what happens next. We don't have to wait till next week. Let's just watch the next one. The cliffhanger all of a sudden doesn't become as much of a cliffhanger as it used to be when you had to wait week to week. You can just go through the whole thing. Matter of fact, we even say that our closest friends and our real friends are the ones who instantly respond to our texts. You're not really my friend if I don't send you a text message and I immediately don't see bubbles coming up in my phone. At least I know you're working on it when I see bubbles coming up. At least I know you're trying to respond, and I can be a little patient and wait for you. What do you mean? You haven't responded? It's been five minutes. You're not sitting down waiting for me to communicate with you? You mean you might have something else going on? How dare you? You're not really my friend. This is the world we live in. We've been conditioned to this, man. And we've taken the bait, and we think that we have to have everything now. And so to tell a generation that has been conditioned to instant gratification that tomorrow matters, it's really a foreign concept. They don't really understand that tomorrow indeed does matter because we're so focused on living for today. 
Matter of fact, there was a poll that was done by CNN in an article that I came across that said that 76% of people are living paycheck to paycheck in the United States of America. And I know that some of those circumstances are definitely legitimate where there are outside circumstances affecting your paycheck and affecting the way that you have to live and spend money because I know you may be in a more challenging situation. But I believe that really the majority are living for today with little regard for tomorrow because we can see this with our time. But I think that we also have an issue with this instant gratification thing when it comes to our finances and the way that we think about finances. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he said that we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That we should actually be transformed in the way that we think. We should renew our minds to think differently. When it comes to the subject of finances, we need to think differently than the way we've thought if we want to live with less is more and live without stress and live in a way that giving is good and living like tomorrow matters more intentionally with purpose. It's going to take a different way of thinking because it's just not all of a sudden going to change. And you ask, well, why are we talking about finances in church? Why have we been going through this series? Because if we can't talk about it here, where can we talk about it? Believe me, I know that you may be a little uncomfortable talking about finances in church. I grew up in a church that abused finances. I grew up in a teaching that abused the financial teaching of what you would see in Scripture and used it for selfish gain and used it for materialism. And I saw that used to, to uh, pad the pastor's pocket or to pad uh, the ministry's pocket or to uh, enable people to live lavish lifestyles. And I've seen all of that. I experienced it. I was a part of it for the majority of my life, and God set me free from it. But yet, just because someone else has abused it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought somebody would have said amen on that. I said just because other people have abused it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. People are going to abuse and twist Scripture all day long, but that still doesn't mean that the things are true cease to be true and we should avoid them like taboo just because someone else misused it and abused it. We need to look at it in context. We need to look at it truthfully and see what God has because here's what I experience. As a pastor of a church, I see people that are at some of their lowest points and they'll come and talk to me about their struggles. They'll talk to me about their pain. They'll talk to me about their fear. They'll talk to me about their worry. They'll talk to me about their addiction that has been caused by something they were worrying about where they were looking for some sort of soothing or some sort of comfort. And they come and talk to me about these things and they'll be very vulnerable with me about these things. And a lot of their problems are attached back to the desires of their heart. And some of them, a lot of them, misuse of their finances. And so I'm trying to save us a lot of grief here by talking about finances God's way. So we need to get over this thing of not talking about finances in church. Amen, somebody? We need to learn how to make change now so we don't have to live with all this bondage tomorrow and we don't hand it to our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids and there's just cycles of poor financial management. Because so many people will open up their chest and they'll be vulnerable when you want to talk to them about their problems. But the moment you want to talk to them about financial problems, all of a sudden people put up a wall and don't want you to talk to them about that because people get really funny and really personal about finances. That's why we need to go to this because Jesus said in Luke 12 and 34, where your treasure is there, your heart is also. So there's things attached to your heart. They're attached to finances and God knows that. And we need to make sure that we give it to God because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Amen. We need to recognize our role as just stewards and we need to make change in the way we think. We need to make change in the way that we steward. And tomorrow does matter, so we need to stop living instant gratification lives where I have to have it now, here and now. I want it yesterday and we have to start thinking ahead because we want to give and build margin in our lives so we can live a life that will truly glorify the Lord. Proverbs 21 and verse 20 in the New Living Translation says this, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. My mom used to say, Derek, if you had a dollar for every matchbox car you bought, you might be a millionaire. <laughs> I remember hearing that as a kid because I'd get a dollar and I would love to go to the store and it was burning a hole in my pocket. That's what I used to hear growing up. All that money's just burning a hole in your pocket. Or I'd mow a neighbor's yard for five bucks. I could get five cars for five dollars and I would love to collect those little matchbox cars as a kid and I just buy them and buy them and lose them and buy them and lose them and need to get more and I began to think about all of that stuff and how that just I just wanted that instant gratification and I just had to go have something and we live that way 
foolishly so often and we get into these bad habits and we never learn to live like tomorrow matters. And when tomorrow comes, we always are just looking for a way to barely get by. Folks, that is not a healthy way to live. Amen, somebody? Just living on barely getting by street, stressed out, always having all this pressure and all this junk. The enemy loves to put all the shiny stuff in front of you and put all the neighbor's stuff in front of you and say, you have to have this and you have to have it now and this is the only way you're going to matter or be significant or any way uh, that anyone's ever going to respect you is if you had this parking space or this position at the company or if you make this much money, live in this kind of house, drive this kind of car or this kind of motorcycle. Hello, somebody. I'm not trying to get anybody's business this morning. HD does not stand for Harley Davidson. It stands for hundreds of dollars. That's what it stands for, hundreds. There's an S on that hundred, hundreds of dollars. There's so many things that you think you got to have, so many things that you think that you have to have now. And this generation especially thinks that they are entitled to the things that their parents and their grandparents have maybe taken years and years to actually acquire. They think they need to buy a house now. They have to have this kind of car now. They have to live this type of lifestyle, take these type of vacations now, and they think that's what they're entitled to. They make a lot of bad decisions because they're not living with tomorrow in mind. They're living for today because they've been conditioned to instant gratification. But Scripture says that it's a fool that spends his money that way. Fools just spend whatever they get. And then if they run out of stuff to spend, I guarantee you there will be an offer in the mail for a 0% interest credit card that you can continue to spend. There will always be someone saying, guess what? You're pre-approved. Ooh. Ooh. Well, you sent me this in a golden envelope, and I'm pre-approved, and you've got my name on it. And you'll give me how much money? For what? 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 The same as cash for like 12 months. That's awesome. And we buy into this temptation that we'll just keep on acquiring, getting more and more stuff, and it'll make us happy. And it doesn't. It just creates more and more problems. I don't know how many people I've counseled over these issues that have come about as a result of you did this, you did that, you spent this, you spent that, finger pointing, blame shifting, all of this stuff that came out of these addictions maybe because they were just looking for a way to escape the pressure and it doesn't honor God and God wants us to live wise, amen? Tomorrow matters so we've got to change how we live today. We've got to change how we live today. This is something we've got to decide now. It's not something we decide next week. It's something we're going to decide to do today because we understand that tomorrow matters. If you have your Bible, flip over to Proverbs chapter 6. We want to look at one of the Proverbs of King Solomon, the wisest man to have ever lived. Proverbs 6, let's look at verse 6 here and see what Solomon says. He's giving some practical advice here, and here's what Solomon writes. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, any officer, or any ruler, she prepares her bread in summer. She gathers her food in harvest. Solomon says, go to the ant. She by nature has this internal system built into her that tells her that something is coming and she needs to prepare and she needs to make sure that she doesn't just eat everything she gets but that she stores up something for later because she knows that there is something coming. We know that same thing that is coming in the state of Wisconsin. And I know it's a curse word, and it begins with the letter W. It's that letter W curse word that you don't want to hear right now because right now we're living in the nice, beautiful summer, but yet we know that winter is coming. Oh, pastor, how dare you say that? In church, of all places. Winter is coming, and we know winter is coming, and so does the ant. The ant knows that winter is coming, man. And so the ant says, I've got to prepare for later instead of just eating everything that's in front of me, everything that I collect. I have to prepare, and I want us to make sure that we live a life in a way that we are preparing and that we're making margin because we understand, listen, tomorrow matters. We want to live not just for what we can get and enjoy today, because enjoying today is wonderful, but also we don't want to create stress in our lives because we haven't prepared for tomorrow. I have this uh, clay chimney at my house, and I'm on my second one, and it just broke the other day, and I was really upset about it because I love this thing. But the very first one I bought, I made the mistake, being a guy from the South who didn't grow up in Wisconsin, I left it out thinking it would be fine, right? 
wrong. The very next spring, when I went out to make my first fire, I stuck a log in it. What do you think happened? The whole thing just crumbles right in front of me. That thing was like 75 bucks, man, for a clay pot. Are you kidding me? $75 clay pot crumbled before my eyes because I didn't do what? I didn't put it up for the winter. I didn't make preparations. And even this past spring when I put my new one out there, I thought that last year I had done due diligence by putting it up soon enough, but apparently I didn't put it in the right place. Or either I'm just buying cheap stuff, man, because this thing crumbled and it started cracking. I'm going, what is the deal? If we want stuff to last, we've got to make preparations. And we know this by nature. There's things you go ahead and prepare for. You go ahead and prepare for maybe if you have a, a, a certain kind of two-wheel drive vehicle, maybe you want to put some sandbags in it, you know, to get ready for winter because you don't want to be slipping and sliding on the road in your truck if it's not four-wheel drive. You make these preparations. You make these adjustments, but you know it's coming. If you wait until the last minute, your pot's going to crumble, Right? If you wait till the last minute, this thing is going to break because you weren't prepared. You didn't make the necessary preparations. You weren't living like tomorrow mattered. You were only living for what you could enjoy today. So I want to give you three things that I want you to write down, and we're going to talk about each one of these things, that is going to help you be in a better position financially to live like tomorrow matters. The first thing we're going to do is we are going to begin with the end in mind. And I want to help you. I know some of you are great goal setters, and this type of talk energizes you, and you get, and you get excited with sermons like this. And some of you, you're not goal people. You're not people that have been accustomed to, nor maybe taught or shown how to set goals. And this is how we're going to do this. We're going to start with the end in mind. And I don't know how far out you want to look, but I just want to encourage you to just do this if maybe you've never set goals before. I want you to set a goal for the end of this year. You've got six months left. For the end of this year, I want you to set a goal and set a realistic goal. I mean, in, in six months, you know, if you just purchased a new home, the odds are you're probably not going to pay it off in six months. If you just purchased a new car last week, you're probably not going to pay it off by the end of this year. So that's not the type of goals we're talking about. We don't want to set you up to fail. Set yourself up to succeed. Say, where do I want to be in six months? Maybe that's a dollar amount in your savings account. Maybe that's a dollar amount that you want to begin to give away. Maybe you want to be intentionally generous beyond your, your regular tithe that you give at church. Maybe for you, maybe it's starting to tithe. Whatever the case may be, you set some sort of goal and you begin with the end in mind. So take this year, 2017, in mind. Where do I believe that God wants us to be by the end of 2017? And then ask yourself this question. Ask yourself, what was the last thing that I would have done before that goal was achieved? What was the last thing you did? What was the last decision you made? Because for you to get from here to there, there's going to have to be a series of decisions that are going to have to be made to get you there. Because you're not going to get there overnight. You're not going to walk into work Monday morning and the boss says, Hey, guess what? I heard about your goal. I want to help you get to it. Here's a huge check. I mean, that may happen to you, and God bless you if it does. But for most of us, for 99.9% .9 of us, that's not how it's going to work. The ant's the one that's preparing, remember. The ant knows that winter is coming, so the ant is making necessary preparation. So we can even look at that as a teacher and as an example, as Solomon said. So we want to make sure that we're beginning with the end in mind and asking ourselves, what's the last thing we did before that happened? And then guess what? Ask yourself that question again and drill that question all the way back down to where you're at right now. Keep answering that question. So say if your goal is to begin to intentionally live generously and you want to begin to have a certain number in your savings account and you want to have a certain amount of margin in your check to be able to be generous with, well, what's the last thing you did before that happened? If that's your goal by the end of the year, what was the last thing you did? Well, the last thing that you probably did was that you probably created some sort of budget and you implemented that budget. And then probably before you did that, you learned how to make a budget because maybe you didn't know how to make a budget before. You got some teaching. You got some training. Maybe you joined our community group, Money Matters, where you're actually learning how to steward finance as well and how to actually build a budget. Or maybe you went through a Dave Ramsey course or picked up some good resources or watched some good YouTube videos and you learned how to build a budget. And then maybe before that, you had to go, well, what was the last thing I did before I built a budget? Well, I decided that I was going to have to say no to some things in order to say yes to some better things because we need to not sacrifice great on the altar of good. Amen? We need to not sacrifice 
the great things God has for us because we're just settling for good now because that's not going to honor God when we're just having a bunch of good happen in our lives. But when God says, I want great to happen if you'll be wise and follow my principles and follow my teaching and even think like the ant that's putting things away for later, that you begin with the end of mind. Well, when you begin to make that list, guess what? There's some hard decisions you've got to make, isn't it? When you begin to say, I've got to say no to some things now so I can say yes to some things later. That may mean I say no to cable now so I can say yes to having more margin in my budget so I can give and so I can live generously like we talked about last week. Because here's the deal, folks. We know a whole lot more than we actually practice. You may be sitting here today going, Pastor, I know all these things. Yeah, but we know a whole lot more than we practice. We've got a lot of good information up here that we've learned. But it seems that the actual implementation of it and the actual practice of it is where we struggle. And so I know that you may know you need to do a budget. I know you know you need to save money, all that stuff. It's nothing new. You've been told that probably since you were a kid. But you've got to make some hard decisions now. You've got to say no to some things now because if you keep saying yes to the same things you're saying yes now, to now, then you're just hoping and dreaming that you'll get to where you truly want to go. And that's good preaching right there about anything. doesn't matter if it's finances or what. If you, I mean, just, just think about it. What does the Olympic athlete have to say no to in order to be able to compete at a high level to go after that gold medal? What does he or she have to say no to? Probably hanging out with some friends for a while. You think they just get to go hang out with the friends and just do whatever they want whenever they want? You think they have to say no to maybe staying up late, eating certain types of foods? They have to say yes to a lot of what? A lot of practice, a lot of coaching, a lot of discipline. They have to say yes to that so they can enjoy something they want to enjoy later. And it takes a commitment of saying no for a period of time over and over again to say yes to things that may be more difficult so they can achieve what they feel like they really want to achieve. If you're really wanting to be generous, and it's not just a pipe dream, it's not just something you're fantasizing about being generous, if you really want to be a tither, it's not something that you're just fantasizing about and dreaming about and hoping that one day you'll have enough to where you have enough left over to begin to live this way, to where money doesn't control you and you're living beneath your means instead of living paycheck to paycheck, and that's really what you want, you've got to make some decisions now, some hard decisions to say no to some things you've been saying yes to. And it probably looks like a lot of restaurants that you may have to say no to. Maybe cable TV. Maybe be just doing some of the things that you've done frivolously without even thinking about it or intentionally planning it. Not that you can't have fun. Not that you can't do other things. But it's that I'm saying no to these things now because I'm wanting to say yes to this because this is where the priority is. If the priority is really where you say it is, if it's really God, if priority is really generous living, if the priority is really being able to say yes to sponsoring that child in that foreign country that God moved on your heart but you didn't have the money to give, if your heart really is where you want to be able to have more time to be able to spend, to be able to serve people in our community or serve at church, then you've got to make some hard decisions now because it's not just going to all of a sudden just happen and open up for you. You've got to say no to something now so you can say yes to progressing where you believe God wants you to be. But you've got to start with the end in mind and work your way backwards from there. I hope that that helps you. The second thing is going to be to set up an emergency fund. You've heard Dave Ramsey talk about an emergency fund. That means that the ant knows that things are coming and you know things are coming. I think that when stuff breaks down, that that's actually God blessing us, showing us and reminding us that all this stuff is temporary. I think there's a blessing attached to your washing machine breaking. I think there is a blessing that is attached to the transmission going out in the car. It's a reminder that stuff does not last and this is not eternal. That's why Jesus said you need to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where a thief doesn't steal, where rust won't corrode when the roads are sprayed with salt in the winter, or where the moth doesn't come and corrupt. I think that there's a blessing attached to being reminded that this is temporary, that stuff wasn't made to last. Yeah, you can buy good stuff, you can take good care of stuff, but stuff wasn't built to last. And we can't put our hope for joy 
or security or contentment in stuff because it doesn't last. So we have to be wise and we need to set up an emergency fund for when stuff, goes, when stuff does go wrong because it will. Stuff will break, right? I don't care if you buy the best of the best of the best and do all the proper maintenance. One day it will break. And you may have a story about some car and I, I get it, but it's going to break at some point or something will wear out. Something will need to be replaced. Well, if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you're living beyond your means and you're not thinking about tomorrow, then when those things happen, you go into freak out mode and you go into stress out mode because you go, what am I going to do? I guess I'm going to have to put it on a credit card because I don't know what to do. I can't afford it. If you have, like the ant, like Solomon said, prepared and you have an emergency fund set aside that you've been contributing to, when stuff happens, you know what you do? You write the check and you go back to bed or you go about your day. Isn't that an amazing thought that something goes wrong with the car and you just pay for it? Some people are like, I don't know what that's like. I'm used to freaking out over it. Well, what if you had money set aside for emergencies like that and you just wrote it and you're done with it? How much stronger would your marriage be if you weren't fighting over that kind of stuff? How much stronger of peace would be present in your home if you weren't worried about that stuff? This stuff is a thief. It wants to come and steal and kill and destroy. But if you don't allow this stress and all this stuff to run your life and you make preparations, like Solomon said, of the ant, then when that stuff happens, you were ready. You're prepared. Dave Ramsey, the finance guru, he gives baby steps. And you can look at his website, and they're on there. You don't even have to pay for them. You can just read them or watch them on YouTube. His baby step is, number one, you need to get you an emergency fund. He said, I would recommend a minimum of $1,000. You get a $1,000 emergency fund, and you put that aside. That's not money that whenever you want to go out to eat and you rent out of money that you go, oh, I've got the emergency fund. I really need to go out to eat. Going out to a restaurant is never an emergency. Amen, somebody. <laughs> So we need to be wise in our stewardship and let the emergency fund be just for the emergencies. Let it be for when stuff goes wrong or breaks. After you've focused on getting rid of debt, which Dave Ramsey says the next step, and you begin to pay off that credit card debt and all those things like that, you want to try to go for fully funding your emergency fund, which would be three to six months of your expenses. And after you have your emergency fund covered, then he says you need to start investing and you need to seek a professional for that kind of stuff. But let me tell you something. Don't buy stock or invest in stuff you don't understand. And by investments, I'm not talking about the Nigerian prince that sent you an email last week. <laughs> That's not a good investment. And I'm not talking about the lucky pick six and I'm not talking about the latest get rich quick scam. I'm talking about actual investment because consistent and wise investments over time produce great results. The key here is that we want to be consistent because consistent investments that are wise over time, they're going to produce great results. So when you're consistently putting money in that emergency fund, when you're consistently putting money into that 401k, when you're consistently putting that money into that Roth IRA, those are those things that build up over time. That's using wisdom and biblical godly stewardship to live beneath your means and live like tomorrow matters to where you have margin to live and give generously and to honor God with your finances instead of letting stress and worry run your life. You see, as people of God, we should be wise and honorable with our finances and not looking to cheat, not looking to do something immoral with our taxes or looking to cheat the company or our employer, but instead we should be looking to honor God with the way we live our lives because we're doing it as unto the Lord. Amen, somebody? Proverbs 13 and 11 says this, Dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Proverbs 24, verse 3 and 4 says, By wisdom a house is built. Through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. And if you don't know where to start with managing finances and beginning to invest a little over time, I want to give you just a real easy practical rule. It's the 10-10-80 rule. 10% to God first because we want to put God on the front end, not on the back end. 10% to save and invest and then 80% to budget and also be generous with beyond your tithe. My wife and I have something automatically set up in our checking account when I get paid. It's called pay me first account. And one of the things that we do is that it automatically takes a certain portion of my check and puts it in an untouchable fund for us. So that way those things are things that we are making small, wise investments over a consistent long period of time because tomorrow matters. Amen? 
matchbox cars will go away. They're fun for a little bit, but if you always think you need to go out and buy something, every time you get an income tax return, every time that you get a little extra money or a bonus check from the company, and you always think that you need to go out and spend it, I'm telling you, you're living foolishly and you're making a mistake because you're living for today. You need to live like tomorrow matters. Because if we say we want to live and give generously, if we say when we have something move on our heart that we want to give towards, man, I want to have margin in my schedule. I want to have margin in my ability to commit to certain things. And I want to have margin in my finances as well. So that way I have income that if something is moved on my heart or if there's a need, that I can step out and actually do something about it instead of going, man, I wish I could help, but I'm just trying to barely make it myself. That's no way to live. That's not God-honoring. To just say, oh, I'm just trying to hang on by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> Whatever that means. Just barely hanging on. That's no way to live to where you can't be moved by the Holy Spirit to do something and be able to confidently do it because you've actually planned and prepared and made margin to where you could live beneath your means. The only way you're going to be able to accomplish this is to live a life where you understand that less is more and that more is not better, that actually less is actually more. That it's not I need more stuff in order to have but instead, it's living a less is more lifestyle where better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls and chasing after the wind, like Ecclesiastes said. Where I live, where I know that financial stress is bad and I delight myself in the Lord. And he begins to temper the desires of my heart and begins to orient the desires of my heart to where I begin to want what God wants for the same reason God wants it. But the only way I'm going to live that lifestyle is if I learn how to delight in the Lord and put him first. As Matthew 6 and 33 says, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he's going to take care of all the things that you think you have need of. Because God is going to supply all of our needs. He's going to take care of us because he cares for us. Amen, church? We see that over and over again in scripture, but we need to live like it. So we know stress is bad. And then we've learned that giving is good. We've learned that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And that... Receiving is fun and receiving is enjoyable, but that giving is truly even better than that. And those of you who live generous lifestyles and who plan your generosity and are intentional about, with your generosity and pray for opportunities to be generous, both with your finances and with your time and with your talents, man, when you're generous, it's a lot more fun to live that way rather than always being under the gun, never having time for anyone, never having time for anything, keeping everything for yourself and holding on to everything you get because you think you need it. That's not a fun way to live, but being generous is a fun way to live. You've never met a grumpy, generous person because generous people are happy because that money and stuff doesn't control them. If you need something here, what else can I give you? How else can I help you? You'd be like the CMAers that came and were willing to give up their RV for a trip they had planned that they were going to go on for themselves, but instead gave it to a family that had a need so they could be with their daughter at a hospital. I'll never forget that. Just like I shared last week, the people in Mexico that were extremely poor when we went up in the mountains, no running water, no electricity, living in a house made out of cardboard, sticks, and mud, and yet they had prepared us a meal that they wanted to bless us with and they were willing to forgo eating until we had whatever was left over they were going to eat. Why? Because they understood it was more blessed to give than it was to receive. And they were actually living and intentionally preparing for us to come so that they could be a blessing to us. Not because we deserved it, because we sure didn't deserve it. Not that I did anything to earn that CMA or giving me his RV. But because the heart of God beating in their chest... And because they understood something that I'm trying to communicate to us today, church, that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive and to live that generous lifestyle. But generous lifestyles do, do not happen by chance. They don't come through just winning the lottery. They don't come through you just getting favor with the boss and getting the promotion. No, they come through you being intentional. That even if you're working at a job that's not the greatest and the pay may not even be the greatest and you don't like the boss or your coworkers, you can still find the joy of the Lord to be your strength and still find ways to live as, and, and, and give as doing this thing as unto the Lord and not as unto man. 
changes the way you live, but that takes a mind shift. That takes me understanding that I need to renew my mind. I need to change some things. And we learned today that tomorrow matters. You know, we've been talking about making change for the past four weeks now. This is the last message in this series, and, you know, if you need further help to continue to grow, I want to encourage you to get connected with one of our Money Matters groups. It's a four-week group where you can connect with other people here at Word of Grace to begin to learn how to do this stuff, where people can hold you accountable, where they can give you tools that you need if you don't know how to do this, so you can begin to live a life where you're truly stewarding what God has given you with excellence and not living beyond your means and living week to week because that's no fun. I've been there. I understand. I understand. I've made some bad choices in my life too and I could play my violin, tell you my sad story, but let me tell you folks, it's a lot more fun to live generously and to live beneath your means and to have freedom and not be controlled by stuff and by a paycheck and by a job. Amen, somebody? But here's the thing. If you want to be a part of that group, some of them have already ended, but man, we'll find a way to make one happen if you want to be a part of one, even, even if I have to lead it myself. I don't care. I want you to be in it, and I want you to learn this stuff. It's important to me that we all grow in how we handle our finances, but there's things that, that have to happen in order for these messages that I've been preaching over the past four weeks to work. When you are stirred to change, there's going to be conflict happen in your life because anytime you want to change something, there's going to be conflict when you decide to lose weight, all of a sudden those jelly-filled donuts start dancing and singing when you walk past them. <laughs> I, I've never heard them sing before, but I, I, decided to, I decided to go on a diet and lose some weight. Next thing you know, they sing. I didn't even know they could do that. <laughs> yummy, yummy in my tummy is what they're singing. <laughs> but the thing is, there's always conflict. When you decide you want to pray more, all of a sudden you need more sleep all of a sudden. Because you set that alarm clock 20 minutes earlier, right? I want to wake up and pray first thing. Conflict hits. Something kept you up all night. The neighbors or the kids. It always happens anytime you decide to make a change. And it's not going to be any different when you want to make financial change. There's going to be conflict. But as you step up and step through that conflict and you keep moving forward and you stay true to what it is you know that God wants you to do, and you submit to His truth and apply His truth in your life, then you will grow. And there will be a season of rest after you grow. And you look back and you go, wow, I remember when that was really hard, but where we're at now is so worth it. And then you'll have a season of rest until God moves on your heart again and says, all right, it's time to begin to change this. And then you have to go through conflict again. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. There's conflict. There's selfishness that gets involved. I want to be a better parent, spend more time with my kids. All of a sudden, work starts calling or, or other opportunities to go hang out with your buddies come up and you got to go through the conflict and you got to say no to some things. And it's hard, but I promise you that if you'll go through that conflict and you'll stick to the change and you'll dedicate yourself to the change that you believe that God is calling you to and wants you to go to, that you will grow. Thanks for listening to this sermon from Word of Grace. For more sermons or any other information, visit wogcc.com.